Hello and welcome to our second Longwood Seminar of 2012. Uh, my name is David Cameron. I'm the Director of Science Communications here at the Medical School. And we are pleased to see all of you people here tonight. It's great to see such a, such a packed house. Um, this is the 12th year we've been doing this program. And if you have been here before, we are glad to have you back. And if this is your first time here, a special welcome to you. And we're, we're pretty confident that you will enjoy the night. So thanks for being here. Um, this year, this is the second time actually that we have chosen the topics, actually that you all have chosen the topics. We had people vote um, by Facebook and by email. And I think we got something on the order of about 500 um, votes on the topics, and the science of emotions uh, ranked very high. So we hope that you will also enjoy us. So we have uh, two more of these seminars coming up. On April 3rd, the topic is cancer genetics, and that's an area that in the last 10 years has really just exploded and, and changed the way uh, researchers think about and, and treat cancer. And then on the 24th, uh, the subject is stem cells, and that's also been a, an equally transformative area of medical research. So before we go into the program, we have a few uh, quick announcements to make. Uh, first of all, this program is being videotaped. So if you are determined to not be videotaped under any circumstances, the safe place to sit is either in the back of the room or up on the balconies. So you should do that. And we're also going to be recording. There's going to be a, a podcast, most likely, produced on iTunes from this as well, just so you know. Um, we are also trying very hard to go green around here and to save as many trees as possible. And for that reason, we have printed uh, limited copies of the reading material for this evening. But all of this does live on our website. So if you go to the medical school website, um, everything that was printed out should be there. And for the same reason, we're also trying, we're going to try to do our surveys um, electronically this year as well. So after the fourth seminar, we're going to be sending out electronic uh, evaluations for, uh, for the course. And if you do not have internet access, just see one of the volunteers and we'll be glad to give you a paper survey to fill out. Um, we also are giving out our certificates of completion. So anyone who has attended three or more of these programs Will uh, is eligible to receive it, and if you have any questions about that as well, just pull one of the volunteers aside. Um, teachers, if you are here to get professional development points, um, you have to fill out, attend all four sessions, and each time fill out the blue form that is available at the door when you checked in, in case you didn't get it. You can either give it to one of us at the end of the night or simply mail it in. And you all should have also received an index card. So if you have any questions about any of the material tonight, write it down on the card. And about halfway through the program, uh, you're going to see people sort of wandering up and down the aisles, waving index cards, looking your way and smiling. And so just uh, pass the card over to them. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure your questions do get addressed. Um, we are also happy to announce that we have a brand new Facebook for a Facebook page for Harvard Medical School, and we would love you to like us. So if you go to the page and click the like button, you'll get all sorts of news and updates uh, brought to your news feed. And there is, many of you no doubt know, a current Longwood Seminar Facebook page, but that's going to be deactivated on the 16th, and all of the information there is going to go to the new page. And we are continuing to have people kind of stream in, and that will probably happen uh, the first half hour of the program tonight. So anything you can do, if there's empty seats beside you, uh, to move to the center to just make it uh, a little bit more convenient for people who continue to come in, that would be wonderful. And if you have on you any sort of mobile device that makes noise, uh, please tell it to be quiet now. So the topic for tonight, it's called Singing in the Shower to Shaking in Your Boots, The Science of Emotion. This, uh, this program was put together, this topic really started with a theme issue that we had for uh, the magazine that we publish here called Harvard Medicine Magazine. Uh, last summer, we published an issue on the science of emotion that had 
lots of articles um, exploring the subject in many different ways. And tonight, what we are presenting is kind of a, a small sampling of the larger body of material that we had in that issue. You, could, you can go to our website and find uh, the summer 2011 issue of Harvard Medicine, and you could read everything uh, that we published and that we wrote on the subject there. And if you actually want to get onto our e-newsletter for the magazine, just send us an email at longwood underscore seminars at hms.harvard.edu, and we would be happy to sign you up for that. Um, so our presenters tonight, I am going to actually introduce uh, all of them right now, and then rather than having one person speak and then getting up and introducing and to make it uh, move a little bit smoother. Um, we have tonight speaking doctors Richard Schwartz and Jacqueline Olds, and they are both clinical professors of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Uh, they collaborate quite often. Not only are they co-authors on many books, but they happen to be married to each other. And that uh, gives them special expertise in the subject that they will be talking about tonight, which is love. We have Dr. Mohammed Milad. He is also here. He's an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the director of the Behavioral Neuroscience Lab at Massachusetts General Hospital, my old job. Um, Dr. Milad will be speaking about fear. And, but first, we're gonna hear from Dr. George Valiant. Uh, Dr. Valiant is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and he spent the last 35 years as director of the study of adult development at the Harvard University Health Service. Uh, tonight, he will be speaking about happiness. So, Dr. Valiant. You all get enormous points for being the only audience I've ever spoken before that came at least 10 minutes early. <laughs> Practically every one of you. Uh, let me see if I can get this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about happiness. I'm going to be kind of a warm-up speaker for Jackie and uh, Richard. But as a way of beginning, how did you feel being outdoors today compared to the way you felt the last time you got a really good deal on a pretty dress. <laughs> and the difference is the difference between happiness and joy. I theoretically reflect the grant study where I've spent the last almost 40 years now, where it was begun deliberately to study health and not illness. Very few have thought it pertinent to make a systematic inquiry into the kinds of people who are well and do well. And it's also important to feel well. And to do that, it's very important to realize the distinction between happiness and joy. Happiness is all about you, usually in time present. You had a feeling of discomfort, and now it's satisfied. But the problem, of course, with happiness is it has no sticking power, and it's more appraisal than feeling. Joy, on the other hand, is very hard to feel without the presence of another person. Probably virtually everybody in this room said with a smile to someone else, how wonderful that spring has finally sprung. Now, 
to do this, we've got to get away from the way Harvard Medical School thinks. A cardinal rule of living is don't believe everything you think. Your heart is a much better judge. And the little fox in Saint Exupere's Little Prince understood that perfectly when he said, only with the heart can we see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye. Now, in 1943, when uh, Saint Exupere wrote this, autism was just about to be discovered. Nobody in the universe could conceive of a disease that left you without empathy, that left you without being connected to your um, heart. And it's only in the last 10 years, as people began studying the insula, and most of you have never heard of the insula, so I suggest you Google it when you go home. But basically, the insula is how the brain is connected to the heart, and the insula is also connected to the way you felt today on the first day of spring. Now, I was asked about a year ago, what had I learned from 45 years of work on the grant study? And this is what I wrote. And I promise, Jackie, that I'm not going to use that terrible four-letter word, love, it's enough to tell you about that really scary three-letter word, joy. Now, when I was in medical school, <laughs> not so very long ago, but before most of you were born, these were the four emotions we were taught about. They were called the four Fs. Lust is also synonymous with sending valentines. <laughs> but this was what emotion was. It was all negative. And everything in Fox News, which sells better than anything around, is all about negativity. And negativity isn't really great for your health, but it is attractive. Around 1990, psychologists who hadn't listened to the Little Prince began to study what they called was positive emotion. And today, in 2012, despite all that Jackie and Mohammed and hopefully I have been trying to teach the world, this is sort of the NIH instrument for measuring positive emotion. The positive emotion and negative affect scale has these as emotions. These, my friends, are not emotions these are largely based in the reticular formation, and it's by stimulating these that we know whether a cat is alive or dead. <laughs> and, and it's just as inconceivable that this is how the human mind thinks as it is that it took them until 19... 43, where they had already understood quantum mechanics, to understand that there was a disease with the absence of empathy. Now, in 1999 to 2000, I was privileged to be one of the founding members of Positive Psychology. And 
what positive psychology called positive emotion was happiness, contentment, good cheer, well-being, pleasure. Again, those are all coming from the neocortex, and they're all about me. You never have had to have a shred of empathy or the capacity to have a friend to enjoy these sl emotions slash appraisals. This is modern education at work. This is an, an eight-year-old girl, I'm proud to say my granddaughter, <laughs> coming home from a funeral, writing out the secret of happiness. These mostly are positive emotions. This is what is meant by the counterpart of hate, lust, fear, and hunger. Only they're further up in the brain. And picture. Her mother asked her, why do you have picture there? And she said, well, you know, it's understanding what's going on in someone else's mind. There is basically what Fonagy in the last 10 years has talked about as the cutting edge of understanding the mind. And children have no trouble understanding this because children know enough to see with the heart and that clearly is where I'm lovingly suggesting that you turn your attention. Forgive me for um, reading, but when you get to be my age, the um, memory doesn't work very well. There is no question that many of you would agree that happiness is getting lucky. Only when you're my age, getting lucky means finding your car in the parking lot. <laughs> now, what I'm going to talk about as joy is the phenomenon of the returning human face. And the returning human face is like the returning sun. It's an innate releaser of joy, just as most of you experience today. Joy is not just happiness. Joy is often reunion. Happiness and excitement are for anniversaries, like Bastille Day, the glorious fourth, and a Surprise! Birthday party. It lasts but for a day. Joy is how our parents felt the first day they met us in the hospital. And even though it's also mixed with tears, as joy often is, it's a gift that keeps on giving ever since our parents saw our bright shining faces. Even at two months, the infant smile is unrelated to drive reduction. It's specifically released by the joyful mutuality of eye contact with a loving caregiver. Developmentally, a child's smile evolves at the same time that kittens learn to purr and dogs learn to wag their tails. These social responses are elicited by and in turn elicit in us positive emotions, not the kind I showed you in those first two slides, like attention. They all occur at the point when the infant's limbic system, about which I'll tell you in a second, uh, is connected to our 
forebrain, the front part of a mammal's brain that makes them different from the dinosaurs. Pleasure is all about me. Positive emotion is all about the other. And with maturation, narcissism evolves into love. That's the story of human evolution. After all, and you know, the Freudians and the behaviorists just couldn't get this into their thick and very intelligent brains. After all, a just fed, clean diapered, and well-slept infant can smile at her mother with contagious joy. And that smile can make the mother smile and feel joy in return. The human smiling response is hardwired. Connection, community, reunion, joy. Joy is how the selfish genes become unselfish. It's win-win all the way around, and happiness eats your heart out. Mm. Forgive me. It's all part of the life cycle, and I really like being 77. You don't have, <laughs> you discover that um, Things like cellulite are diseases of 50-year-olds. I don't waste a moment's sleep. Now, alone on a desert island, we can laugh ourselves happy watching old Marx Brothers and Seinfeld reruns. but we feel joy and often tears when a rescuer arrives at the desert island. Even those of us who've never been rescued from desert islands have all experienced tears of joy, tears of connection. But we're scared of joy. Now you say that's perfectly silly and still you, until you start working seriously with patients who talk about joy. The ax is going to fall. Tall poppies never make it. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. The most obvious example is Icarus. You remember Icarus had these wonderful wax wings and Icarus was able to fly. And who here hasn't wanted to be able to have wings and fly like the birds? And yet, have you ever seen a picture of Icarus happy? No. The paintings of Icarus are all him crashing and burning to the ground because his father, like too many of us parents, has told his son, boy, don't fly too near to the sun. It'll melt your wings. Now that's the stupidest thing anyone ever said. Any of you who's ever gone skiing, anyone who's ever climbed a hill, knows that the nearer you get to the sun, at least in this veil of tears, the colder it gets. There's no way that Icarus would crash and burn. Well, let's take another example. This fellow Freud, who in the 19th century helped put emotion on the map. It's true he didn't let music into his house unless the piano was removed the next day. God help us with positive emotions that stir our heart too strongly better to be pessimistic. 
future evolution and all that. But Freud, in writing about emotions in 24 volumes, you can't find joy anywhere in the index. And yet those of you who know a little German know that Freud means joy. Well, now that's an upside down world, just as it took people so long to discover empathy and so long to discover real positive emotion. And when in a group of world famous psychologists that were trying to get psychology off the ground and were writing down what the important skills were, and I raised my hand and said, shouldn't love be there? Whole new idea. It's not easy to think about love and joy, even though they're so obvious. And so it's much easier to talk about happiness than joy. And this is why the um, scientists uh, and the economists love it. Now this is just to remind you of what the brain looks like. This is what the panis scientific picture of positive emotion looks like. It's basically the reptilian brain. And as you know, 200 million years ago, I mean 60 million years ago, dinosaurs became extinct and mammals lived on. And what mammals had was a limbic system. And a limbic system teaches us to play, to have a separation cry, and to love. I've run out of time, but thank you for listening. Our next speaker is Mohammed, who's going to make us really shake in our boots. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for uh, coming to listen to us. I'm uh, delighted to be here. And uh, just a little disclaimer here, I'm not a clinician, I'm a basic neuroscientist. And what I do is I study circuits in the brain that lead to certain behaviors. I'm a behavioral neuroscientist. And what I'm interested in is one particular emotion and what kinds of circuits that drive that emotion and that is fear. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about fear, but I'm really most interested in fear not. That is, how do we regulate fear? How do we control fear when it's no longer appropriate? So the, the very simple question that drives my research and what I do for a living is this basic question. How do we learn not to fear? Now, we just have to be clear about two, two things here. There are two types of fear. We think there are two types of fear, at least. One is innate, that you're sort of born with it, and you're sort of already hardwired or programmed in your brain. But there are other types of fear that you learn or you acquire. You, uh, and the way you acquire those types of fears is through associations. So um, th the question then, how do we form associations, or how do sensory stimuli gain emotional significance that then leads to driving your fear responses. Now, I'll just give you an example. Uh, when I was maybe seven or eight years old, I had couscous for dinner. And then I got very sick uh, to my stomach. And that probably has nothing to do with couscous or anything I ate, because my entire family ate couscous, and no one got sick except for me. To this day, I do not eat couscous. <laughs> And the reason is, is you develop this, this, in this example, it's called conditioned taste aversion. Basically, you, you, you ate something and now you're just irrational as it may be. Your, your brain just formed this association between, my brain, between couscous and getting sick. So I just, even getting close to the smell or something, it just gets me nauseous now. And uh, those of you who have been unfortunate in having a, been in a car accident, for example, while a particular song is playing, um, Lady Gaga or something like that, and 
you know, uh, two uh, weeks later or a month later, you hear the song and then you're right back into that accident. So how, how do these associations are formed? That's what we're interested in. And, and, and once they're formed, what can we do or what does the brain do to then get rid of them when they're no longer needed, when there's no more fear? You hear Lady Gaga again and again, and is, you don't get into car accidents, you should not, that, that song should not trigger fear. Yet in some people it does. Why am I still afraid of couscous? That's the, that's the question. So to study that, we, we use Pavlovian conditioning. I'm not sure how many are familiar with Pavlov and his dog. Good, so the majority. Uh, um, so it's a classical conditioning. Pavlov is a Russian physiologist in the early uh, 20th century looking at conditioned reflexes and uh, actually wasn't really looking at conditioned reflexes, he was looking at salivation and digestive system, but just came into discovering this accidentally when he would drain a bill and then would give his dog um, a piece of meat, the dog would salivate. So he, the, the, what the dog learned to do is to form an association between the sound of the bell and the food. And so that became sort of the basis for everything we do here in terms of how do we study fear. Uh, and it, it's one of the very predominant models. Now, the way we study fear in animals uh, in the laboratory, also with humans, and I'll get to that, is um, by using the basic principles of this paradigm, except that we use aversive stimuli. So this is what we do when we study these kinds of things in the, uh, in the laboratory. So we, we put an animal in a cage and we play a stimulus, in this case, let's say a tone. So the, 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 the animal hears the tone, it's neutral, it's meaningless, sort of like Lady Gaga's song or my couscous before I got sick. And it has no emotional significance to the animal. Then we condition the animal by playing the tone now, and at the end of the tone, we, we uh, give the animal a mild aversive shock. Now the animal forms an association. We teach the animal to basically become afraid of the tone. Uh, now the, 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 and so then we extinguish the fear by playing the tone without any stimulation. And you see this, just to give you an idea of what behavior looks like here, this is a freezing response. When the animals are afraid, they basically freeze or they, they won't move. That's a, a normal response. You see that their fear goes up here as they learn to fear that tone. And then on the following day, we play the animal, we play the tone to the animal, and then we gradually decrease their fear by stopping the the aversive stimulation. So this is what we call is the extinction learning. We teach the animal not to become afraid because now the aversive stimulus is no longer present. Now, we bring the animal the third day and we now test its memory for safety. Would you fear or would you not fear this tone? And animals that go through this learning not to fear or the extinction training, they show low fear response to that tone compared to animals that don't go through that training. So then what we're interested, again, in understanding this circuit here. Now, in terms of learning to fear or forming the association, as I was talking about, uh, th during that formation of that association, you get a lot of uh, basically fight or flight responses like defensive behavior, autonomic arousal, analgesia. The more, the, the more we receive stimulation, even humans, you get something called conditioned analgesia. You become less aversive, if you will, that, that, that become less painful, if you will, if you go to that, to that end. All, a number of other uh, activation of the hypothalamic uh, pituitary axis, and so on and so forth. Now, we know very much about the circuit. We've studied it um, the past two decades, and I'll just mention one particular brain area that is the amygdala. I'm sure you've heard of Now, of course, that is not the only brain area that is involved in this fear condition. I just want to make sure that it's clear. There are a number of brain regions that are interacting with the amygdala, but essentially the information that gives into the brain, there are two routes. There's a very quick route that goes from the thalamus that brings that tone and shock association to something called the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. It gets processed to a different part, the central nucleus, and then the output goes to different brain regions in the brainstem and the hypothalamus, and then drives that fear response that we all feel when we hear that song or when we face stimuli that induce fear. There's also another, there's more processing within the amygdala. But there's also another route that goes from the thalamus up to higher cortical regions Okay, in this case, the auditory cortex if we're playing an, an auditory stimulus, or it would go to visual cortex if we're playing a visual stimulus, or showing a, a visual stimulus. And then from there, it goes down back to the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, and it gets processed the same way. So there are two routes. One, again, is through from the thalamus to the amygdala and then down to the brainstem without a need of the cortex, really. 
But then there is another route that goes up to the, corte to the cortex and then down to the amygdala. Now, the idea here is that there's a quick route that is direct from the thalamus to the amygdala that say you're walking, and this is from uh, Jaladu's uh, work, that if you're walking in the woods and you see what looks like a snake, what you do immediately is you basically freeze or right away try to avoid that. The reason is because you have a very quick route from the thalamus directly to the, to, to the, to the amygdala, but then the information also goes up to the visual cortex to confirm, is that really a snake or does look like a snake, but it's not, okay? And that's basically in it for the, what, how you process information when you see stimuli that are aversive. Okay, now let's say we got rid of the fear, okay? And you go through that training process that I told you about where you play the tone without any more aversive stimulation or you eat couscous and you don't get sick, or how does it, what happens? Does the fear memory go away when you go through with the fear extinction? The answer is no, and Pavlov told us back in 1927 that conditioned reflexes invariably or spontaneously return sooner or later. So what that means is that when you go through a conditioning and an extinction procedure, so you learn to fear certain stimulus, then you extinguish it. What happens in your brain is you form a fear memory that stays in your brain despite you going through an extinction training. So what does extinction do? Well, extinction training forms another memory, a safety memory, if you will, that then is stored in your brain alongside with that fear memory. And then when you're exposed to any stimuli out here, the two memories have to fight it out. Now, which wins is gonna depend on a number of factors, one of which is the context in which you're receiving that stimulus. Is it in a safe context? Is it in the original context in which you were trained or conditioned? Or is it in a different place that is safe? For example, if I go back to where I had my couscous, I probably would not like it. But if I eat it here or if I eat it in Iowa, I'd probably be okay. Um, so that basically what we are looking at is the interaction between these two memories and where does that happen in the brain. So one of the techniques we use is basically put in electrodes in the, into a, the rat brain and record single neurons from the animal to see what the cells do. And one of the areas we're interested in is the prefrontal cortex. And we can isolate certain neurons from the brain. I'm not gonna go over, I'm just gonna skip that. When we recorded from brains in the animals, we found two populations of animals. Animals that show low fear when they're tested after extinction memory, and animals that show high fear despite them going through extinction. There are two just natural groups. One that developed, despite them going through extinction training or safety training, they still showed high fear. And the other group went through the extinction training or the safety training and they held on to that memory, that safety memory. And the animals that showed low fear had that big response in a brain region called the, the infralimbic cortex in the rat. Where animals that did not show that safety memory did not show that signal. So what that suggested to us is that this brain, this activation here, this very brief pulse of neural firing in the brain can actually drive or potentially drive safety and make the animal fear less. So we tested that by trying to trick the brain. Can we condition an animal and then give it this safety memory artificially? Can we implant electrodes and we make an animal fear less? And when we did that, we found that, in fact, that is possible. We can stimulate an animal after having learned to fear. We can artificially reduce its fear responses by turning on a stimulator. So that we can, by us giving it what we think is a safety signal, we can basically manipulate the animal's behavior to fear less, despite the fact that the last thing the animal learned about this stimulus is that it was dangerous. But we, with turning on micro-stimulation, at a particular frequency, at a particular time, we can actually reduce its fear. Now, can, can we test these circuits in humans? That's the obvious question, and that's what one of the driving forces for what we do is to try to understand the human brain. Well, to do that, we developed a model or paradigm that would be similar to that we use in the rat. Uh, our subjects, human subjects, either healthy or anxiety, patients with anxiety disorders, I'm not gonna talk about anxiety disorders, but I'll talk about healthy subjects. They go through a paradigm in which we basically put them in a scanner or outside an fMRI scanner. We hook up electrodes to their hands that measure their skin conductance. Basically, it's how anxious you are. You might notice that when you get anxious, your hands will sweat, and that's what we measure. 
and we connect shock electrodes to our subject's hands, and we also shock our subjects. Now, don't be alarmed. It's a, it's a shocker that is powered by a 9-volt battery. So there's no, it's, it's sort of like a, the static shock that you, that you get in the winter, that, that kind of shock. But it's annoying, um, and our subjects don't like it. And, uh, but they, uh, anyway, so they, they, they look at this picture. Now, I want you to keep an eye on this lamp here. Now, after a few seconds, we turn this light on. It's blue, and then we shock our subjects. So now we teach them to fear that blue light, and they don't like it. Now, of course, it's, it, again, it's an aversive shock, but it's not painful. Then we teach them not to fear by showing them now this blue light in a different room, and this time we don't use the electric stimulation. And then we bring them back the following day and we test their safety memory in the room in which they learned not to fear, but we also bring this blue light back into the original context in which they learned to fear. And what we actually see is that we can bring their fear back. So here, we teach you to become afraid of the blue light, we teach you to extinguish your fear to the blue light, you go home, now you have two memories in your brain. Be, be afraid of the blue light in this room, don't be afraid of blue light in this room. We, we test you, that's exactly what we see by looking at your skin conductors. Your fear is low here, your fear is high here. Now we ask your brain, what areas turn on when you're expressing the safety memory? We found in two different cohorts of subjects, two, individual, two different uh, healthy uh, subjects, the thicker this brain area, now we can take pictures of brain in MRI and then stretch the cortex and then look at the thickness, how thick or thin the cortex is in relation to how well you can control your fear. And what we found is that this brain region here called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, so if you basically take a cut my brain this way and then look sideways, you'll see it. I don't know if you can imagine that, but you can try. Um, anyway, so the thicker that, that brain area, the better your ability to control fear. And that is, that's, air, that's the area, by the way, that is homologous to that in the rat that we learned about, it called infralimbic cortex, that when we stimulate, you reduce fear. So just like the rat, we have an area here in the prefrontal region that the thicker it is, the better your ability to control fear. Also using functional imaging now, this is activation, not structural. The higher the activation in the same region here, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the better your ability to control fear. Now, the opposite was found in a different area, brain area called the dorsal anterior cingulate, okay? So the thicker that brain area, the more fear you acquire, you, you express, and the higher the activity in this brain area, also the more fear you express. So if you will, there's like a yin and yang here between fear control and fear uh, uh, expression. That ventral region, when you activate, you control fear. That dorsal anterior cingulate region, when you activate, you can enhance fear. Okay, now we, what are we doing with all of this? Well, we wanna see, one of the things we're interested in is developing biomarkers. What I mean by biomarker, bi, what I mean by biomarkers is can we predict someone's ability to control or regulate fear before they even go through the fear training experiment? And we did that study by taking a group of people and putting them in a PET scanner, that positron emission tomography that measures your resting metabolism activity. So in other words, I can just take a snapshot of your brain right now while you're resting, not doing anything, okay? And I can measure glucose consumption in your brain. And then four days later, we can go into the fMRI scanner and go through this paradigm, and then we can see, can you, can I use that resting metabolism to predict your, your ability to acquire fear or also to extinguish fear subsequently four days later? What we found is yes, in fact, we can. So the higher this resting metabolism activation in this dorsal anterior cingulate here, the more you acquire fear four days later or three days later approximately. So there's a way that we can potentially look at the brain of an individual and see if we can possibly predict who would show more fear and who would show less fear. Now what do we do with that information? We can discuss, but the idea basically here is that we can try to identify people who are uh, at higher risk for developing anxiety disorders, for example, and try to do something about that before they are exposed to traumatic events. Okay, so 
all of this is just basic research, and the idea of all of this basic research is to try again, not only to understand it from a basic neuroscience point of view, but to try to develop ways or methods in which we can relay this information to better treatment for anxiety disorders. As you all know, post-traumatic stress disorder is one classic example where there's exaggerated fear responses and continuous. So what we're trying to do is to develop ways, again, in which we can develop novel approaches to control or regulate unwanted fear or excessive fear. And I'm just going to give you two examples here of, of some exciting data. So one of the things that uh, these, this line of research has led to is now that we identify the, 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 the neurobiology of learning not to fear, we can understand the mechanisms underlying this, and then we can look at drugs or pharmacological agents that can enhance this type of learning. Unlike other you know, pharmacological agents that are being used, like SSRIs or uh, you know, benzodiazepines and things like that, which look at or, or try to aim at controlling the, 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 the anxiety symptoms per se. Here we're looking at trying to enhance the learning capacity that is learning not to fear. So here are two examples in which this drug called decycloserine is a cognitive enhancer. It nothing, doesn't do anything to your, to your anxiety or your fear, but when given to patients, in this case here, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, and, and here is, um, I'm sorry, this is OCD and I think this is uh, phobia. Uh, both, can, you can see that the patients that are receiving this pharmacological agent, along with their exposure therapy, it can facilitate that exposure therapy. It can make it faster. The outcome of it can become um, more um, stable in the brain, if you will. Another very exciting um, recent events or recent advances, if you will, is the concept of reconsolidation. Now, this is a, a, also a very, very exciting approach here. It's, it's very different from uh, what, we're study, what we're talking about, but the idea here is that if you form an association between, say, the tone and the shock, right, the idea, the older idea was that those associations are stable in your brain and will always stay with your brain. But it turns out that every time you bring that, that tone memory, that fear memory, that memory goes into a labile state. It becomes fragile, and it has to go through another phase of reconsolidation, okay? So what we can do then is bring back traumatic memories that have been formed years ago, bring them into, into this labile state, and do something to interrupt the, rest, the, the, the storage or the reconsolidation into the brain. Okay? And one way to do that is by something called updating. This is the work of Daniela Scheller and, and uh, Liz Phelps at uh, NYU. Basically, the idea here is you condition an animal and you extinguish the animal. If you give a reminder shock or an aversive event, you can reinstate the fear. Okay? That, it just, it's a classic experiment that, that's well documented. But what they did is that condition, and this is, by the way, was done in humans. This is not in animals. This was in human subjects, healthy human subjects. Then what they did is that they, played, they showed that blue light that I told you about. And 10 minutes later, so this blue light is shown here in red, is again bringing that fear memory into this labile state. And then use the extinction training to reformat that fear memory, if you will. And when they did that, they basically prevented the return of fear, as if you essentially restructured that fear memory into the subject's brains. So there's a lot of exciting uh, opportunities here in which we can look at the human brain and try to understand how it works, how we can not only fear, but how do we control fear, and which would hopefully would lead to developing better ways to control uh, anxiety disorders. And my time is up, so we're going to go from fear to love. <laughs> Thank you. You uh, just observed fear taking hold here, um, but, um, but I, I can do it without slides if, not, if necessary. So, um, uh, love, yes. Um, I'll start by narrowing our focus. Uh, since we don't have very much time, let's just talk about romantic love. Some histories of love have suggested that romantic love is a peculiar invention of Western society. Uh, some historians actually specifically trace the origin of romantic love to the medieval troubadours singing songs of courtly love. But in 1998, 
uh, the anthropologist Helen Fisher and an associate scrutinized 166 societies. Oh, I suddenly got much louder. How are we? Uh, in 1998, the anthropologist Helen Fisher scrutinized 166 societies and found evidence of romantic love in 147 of them. In the other 19, there was simply not enough information to come to any conclusion at all. So Fisher's conclusion was that we have yet to find evidence of a single human society uh, that doesn't believe in romantic love which means that there seem, there's good reason to suspect that there's something very basic in our biological nature that keeps love going, and it's not just our particular poetry. The hot signs of the moment are uh, fMRI studies, uh, which are uh, basically uh, scans that show us lovely pictures of subtle changes of blood flow in the brain. Um, and they let us uh, draw a picture of what's going on when we're in love and what areas of the brain are actually most active when we're in love. So I'll, uh, actually, apropos of George's, the face of the beloved, in these studies of love, uh, uh, what uh, people are actually shown is a photograph of their beloved, and you see what happens compared to photographs of uh, less beloved people. Uh, I'll also talk a little about uh, neurochemical and hormonal changes in our states of love, but the truth is, um, a lot of these fMRI studies of love are small studies. Some of them contradict each other. And uh, I don't think they really have yet told us anything new about love. But they do let us uh, tell some of the wonderful old stories about love in uh, kind of new ways. And the part of the story that Jackie and I are most interested in is uh, how love evolves, or sometimes how love collapses over time. Uh, we're interested in that story. Um, because we do a lot of couples therapy, because we write about lasting relationships and also about their opposite loneliness and social isolation, and uh, because we've been married to each other for 34 years, so we have a, a personal stake in uh, how this story goes. <laughs> um, so um, here's the highly compressed science version of love over time. Um, I don't know if you can see the expression on that Cupid's face. He's saying clear, uh, it's an allusion to defibrillation, uh, but his face is not a, a, a pretty and benign one. Love starts violently. Cupid is warning everybody else to stand back so they don't get hurt. And the cartoon is in a certain way ac accurate. Uh, the first phase of love, which usually lasts for somewhere from, uh, uh, from a few months to about a year, uh, it's magical, it's exciting, and it's extremely stressful. The best way to look for stress in our bodies is uh, to measure the level of cortisol in our blood. Um, I made a list of some of the romantic words of love that I will be using today. Um, um, and um, and I, I, I put parentheses around the ones that I thought better of, a, better of and uh, actually won't use today, uh, but just so you can see them as well as hear them. So cortisol is the, uh, is the hormone that marshals our bodies to devote all their resources to the crisis of the moment. Cortisol essentially tells our bodies uh, the challenge is now. Uh, we'll deal with the future later if we're lucky enough to get there. Um, cortisol levels are in fact very high in the early stage of romantic love. And when cortisol levels are high, uh, we also us usually see a depletion of the neurotransmitter serotonin and uh, serotonin belongs in George's part of the talk. Uh, it's uh, uh, usually associated, higher levels are usually associated with states of well-being and happiness. Uh, low levels go along with obsessive compulsive disorder. And it turns out all those obsessive, intrusive, maddeningly preoccupying thoughts, hopes, terrors of early love. Uh, testosterone levels also go down in both men and women in early love, which seems a little counterintuitive. Uh, but think about bodybuilders. Uh, our bodies in the early stages of love are not building themselves up with an eye to the future. Again, it's now or never. And then somewhere between 12 and 24 months, if love lasts, it all calms down. The passion is still there, more on that later. But the stress, uh, is all gone. Cortisol levels return to normal. 
serotonin levels return to normal. But it's more remarkable than that. Love which starts out as a stress in our lives becomes a buffer against stress. Just like, as George said, other states of human connection, love becomes a powerful factor in our health, in our longevity, in the effective functioning of our immune systems. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, what do our brains look like uh, in this new state of lasting love? We still see, as we do in early romantic love, activation of areas of the brain associated with reward and pleasure, the dopamine reward system. Uh, dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's the, uh, the kind of feel-good part of the brain that makes love pleasurable. Uh, it's also the part of the brain that is activated by drugs like cocaine and alcohol, which leads to the theory that the way uh, a lot of addictions work is by hijacking the same uh, reward systems in our brain that our species depends on to make, um, uh, to make mating and uh, raising children and staying connected with children pleasurable to us. So we keep doing it. Uh, that theory actually just got a new boost in an article that came online in the journal Science just this past Friday and actually made it onto the, uh, uh, the front page of the New York Times. Uh, maybe some of you saw it. It was about fruit flies. Uh, uh, it turns out that uh, male fruit flies who were sexually rejected by the ladies drank four times more alcohol than the fruit fly buddies who got to mate with the girls. Remarkable study, <laughs> yes. Um, same reward center, different ways to get there. Uh, uh, with love, we also see deactivation of the parts of the brain responsible for negative em emotions, uh, like the fear that Mohammed was talking about, and also deactivation of the parts of the brain that are responsible for social judgment. That's true in both uh, romantic love and maternal love, mother's love for their children. The machinery of the brain that's responsible for making critical assessments of other people gets shut down. Uh, there is the neural basis for the ancient wisdom, love is blind. Uh, and it's really there. Uh, uh, but we need to pay attention to one other system in the brain, oxytocin and vasopressin. Uh, they were first uh, discovered as hormones that play important roles in uh, pregnancy and nursing. Uh, but they're also neurotransmitters. Uh, and um, they act as neurotransmitters in some of the same parts of the brain uh, that are involved uh, with the dopamine reward system. And they've been studied a lot in voles. Um, this is a vole uh, because uh, probably uh, for many of you like me, it's not possible to immediately think of what people are talking about when they say they've studied this in voles. Um, it seems that some species of voles are promiscuous and some species of voles are monogamous. Uh, this cute little guy is a monogamous vole, yes, <laughs> uh, a prairie vole. And um, it turns out that the density of oxytocin receptors in the brain of a vole are de what determines whether a vole is promiscuous or monogamous. Uh, more oxytocin receptors, more monogamy. Uh, and published uh, just last month, <coughs> there's a first study in humans showing activation of brain areas that are high in oxytocin and vasopressin receptors uh, when individuals who've been in love for a long time look at a photograph of their beloved. Uh, and oxytocin in particular has a calming effect on us, both on our physiology and our behavior. And it's probably a very good candidate for the bridge between, uh, that links the emotional experience of love with the wonderful health benefits of our connections to others. Uh, but, um, of course, most of us worry that uh, love can actually calm down too much over time and uh, end up something like this. Uh, yes, uh, you can see the caption on that uh, sort of sad, uh, I love you bedroom scene, yes. In fact, many theories of love have claimed that there is an inevitable change over time from passionate love to what's usually called companionate love, uh, essentially a loving friendship that is very precious uh, but has no excitement to it anymore, something like this. Um, uh, one of our favorite depressing studies was done uh, some years ago by uh, a friend named Bob Waldinger, who also has uh, succeeded George with the Harvard uh, adult study. Um, 
Uh, he had people look at videotapes of a conversation they'd had with their partners. And he found that the longer a couple was together, the more likely they were to be wrong about what the other was thinking. Uh, yeah. Uh, so o over time, um, we're less fascinated, less obsessed, and maybe not as attentive and not as curious about the other person anymore. And the result is that we actually get it wrong. Uh, Jackie and I care about this partly because of our own marriage, partly because we write about lasting relationships and what they look like, which is what Jackie's going to talk to uh, talk about in a minute. Uh, so I'm happy to announce that just last month, a study was published of fMRIs of people who responded to flyers and newspaper ads that read, are you still madly in love with your long-term partner? And here's the breaking news. The scientific state of the art investigation of love has now confirmed for the very first time that people who say after 10 to 30 years of marriage, I'm still madly in love with my partner are not lying. Uh, the activation of their dopamine reward centers on fMRI look just like the pattern you see in early stage romantic love. The thrill was in fact still there, uh, but there was more. There was also activation of areas of the brain that were rich in opioid and serotonin receptors, uh, parts of the brain that you don't see lighting up in early romantic love. And these are uh, parts of the brain that have the capacity uh, to calm us down in the face of anxiety and pain. So it looks like in these people you see a kind of best of both worlds love in which there is the calming, uh, reassuring, holding effects along with the continuation of passion and that it's still possible despite the theories that inevitably that last part disappears. So we now know that exists at least in the, uh, the 17 individuals who are part of this fMRI study. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but how is it possible? How, it can, how can it work? Yep, and that's what Jackie's going to talk about. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick cartoon hint. It doesn't look like this, uh, or it doesn't stay looking like this. It looks more like this. Um, our marriage is undergoing something of a renaissance, says the satyr-like uh, old man. Yep. So it's not so much about constancy. Uh, it's about renewal. And that's uh, what Jackie will talk about. Uh, and we talk about it more in a book we wrote a long time ago called that. I don't know if I'm, if this red light is for both of us or whether I have 10 more minutes. Do I have 10 more minutes? Good. All right. So the question Richard was asking is, and we were both asking and mentioned in this book, is how does love renew itself after many years of marriage? And that's what we talked about in our book, and I'm going to summarize really quickly uh, some of what we found in our work with couples over the last uh, 35 years. And I'm not going to have slides, but I'm going to use my fingers. One of the things we have found in our study of relationships is that usually people are moving emotionally closer together or farther apart, and that there's always some motion going on, not just in romantic love, but even in friendships, there's often a very glacial movement closer together or farther apart. And in romantic love, we find that when people are first falling in love, there's an incredibly sort of uh, exciting, buoyant feeling when people are falling in love and they're moving closer together and finding out more about each other. And if this feeling of being swept away is happening for both people at the same time and they feel like they're falling in love, they're at that dangerous phase, sort of stressful phase that Richard talked about, but it's also incredibly exciting. And in the lucky circumstance where people decide that they want to spend their life together or even spend a long while together, uh, if they can survive that stress of the initial period, then they start to get into that phase where they are buffered against stress because of their close relationship, where their oxytocin is you know, increasing and where the fact that they have this stable love relationship, even though it's not always so stable, it means that they are safer in the world than they used to be and they feel more connected. But what we have found is that there is a kind of oscillating movement where people become very close, 
when they have time alone together in a couple. They might have wonderful conversations, make love. They have a kind of intimacy. And when they have that intimacy, then each feels strengthened to be able to make a wider circle in doing their own thing. Maybe during the time during the week, which is, you know, it's during the weekend maybe that they have the time alone together. And during the week, each person is kind of strengthened in doing their own thing because of that closeness. Uh, however, if they don't renew that closeness, if they don't come together maybe by the next weekend or sometime during the week, uh, each person is likely to sort of run out of gas and feel a little less connected with the other person. And so that you want there to be a kind of regular coming together, doing your own thing, coming together, and you want there to be that natural kind of oscillation. And most people, when they're in a good marriage, they don't even notice that it's happening. They may have been lucky enough to have parents who were happily married, and those parents did the same thing. So people just get into a kind of pattern of renewing their closeness without it being a big deal or even having to be conscious of it so much. However, in today's world where we have so many pulls on our energy, where jobs are so demanding, where children take a lot of energy, as they always did, where people might get preoccupied or injured or depressed, you can have a natural drift starting to happen, where people might you know, go do their own thing and sort of forget to renew their closeness. And so I'm going to tell you about an example where a couple might have had a little bit of drift and how they handled it. Let's imagine a couple in their mid-30s. This happens to be a couple that I've seen. The man, Joe, is working at a research lab where he often has to apply for grants and do extra experiments so that he can have enough material for his grant applications. And the wife, Nancy, has a job as a reference librarian, librarian and they have two children, three and five. So she has her, although it's a part-time job, her time is full because she's taking care of the two young kids and doing her job. But as Joe gets ready for his next uh, grant application and is staying late doing his experiments, it turns out there are three or four weeks where he has to stay at the lab late at night and he has to work on the weekends. And Nancy starts to feel abandoned and neglected. She starts talking about how the children are missing their dad. The couple stops being able to go out for supper alone. He's too busy at his work. And she starts to feel a little like a single mom, as she puts it. So soon they are starting that drift, and each of them starts talking with a friend of work about the problems in their marriage. The husband has an attractive female technician he starts to confide his difficulties in and starts to talk about how his wife doesn't seem to understand all the pressures on him. And the wife, Nancy, has a woman friend who reassures her that this drift happens in many marriages and that she, Nancy, has to throw a fit to let her husband know how intolerable it is. So, so Nancy, who has been sitting on this fit for some time, goes home and throws it. <laughs> she says she's sick about hearing about this, this friend at work and that her husband should just remember that he's married to her and quit with the personal talk with the work friend. Joe sulks for a while in the face of this fit, but a couple of days later he announces he's going to spend more time at home and do some of that grant writing at home. And he starts spending more time with his family and he does have to work after supper but he stops all the personal revelations with the work friend. His work friend is a little puzzled, but accepts his increased distance, and the marriage has been repaired for the moment. But here are some of the things that had to happen. One member of the couple had to have what we call a distance alarm, had to notice when the drift was going too far. So the, it wasn't the usual going back and forth, but the drift was going farther and farther. And he had to be willing to recognize the husband that she was right, and that he was putting himself in the jaws of temptation, talking about personal things with this attractive woman at work. He had to be willing to back off, and although he didn't like and start investing more time at home, even though he hated being criticized, they had to overcome a bit of rustiness when they started to repair their relationship because each of them could feel the effects of the drift, even though it only went on for about four weeks. They had to get used to talking intimately and making love again and each had to give up their grudges. Most fights, even in the happiest of couples, start with somebody having hurt feelings. And very soon there's a spiral of hurt feelings, because often the person whose feelings have been slightly wounded 
doesn't want to admit that they could be wounded, so they sort of go about their business, but soon there's an attack that they launch out of nowhere, and the other person isn't sure at all why they're being attacked. So often these fights that seem to come out of nowhere are because somebody's trying to keep their hurt feelings to themselves. This is one instance, you know, in a marriage, it is not wise to be macho about your hurt feelings and never tell the other person what hurt them because then you can have this whole mysterious fight that seems to come out of nowhere. As you can see over the years and decades of this periodic motion where people have to go back and forth with renewing their closeness and then doing their own thing, there are many things that can get in the way. If either partner gets depressed, preoccupied, injured physically or emotionally, or gets too involved with traveling for their work, the rhythm of renewing closeness can get thrown off. And because children and jobs are so demanding these days, it can happen easily and often. As I frequently say to the parents I work with, you're not doing your children any favors by spending so much time with your children that you neglect your partner. But the wonder of a good marriage contract is that it gives each person leave to reel the other person in when they drift too far. Essentially, you have to be willing to say to your partner, how come you're not taking our relationship seriously anymore if your partner does get too preoccupied? And this should not just be an obligation of the woman who often has a better distance alarm than the man. Each partner should feel an obligation to reel the other in when they're distant for too long a time. And thus, with the pattern of ebb and flow, each person regularly can renew the other person's curiosity even in a lasting marriage and renew that passion because when they're off doing their own thing, they each become a little more unknown and have tales to tell when they come home, so to speak. The ebb and flow can be a wonderfully rewarding pattern, but we need to remember it's like a beautiful garden and it cannot go without watering for too long. So you can't have a relationship where you just let the drift happen and you don't signal to the other person you, that you miss them. So what we mean by watering that beautiful garden is the couple having quality time alone to renew their love as much as they are able. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. So here's one that um, I'm just gonna throw out to the whole group and you guys can just uh, jump in. Um, how do you feel about drugs like Prozac that are labeled as happiness drugs? Have they helped or hurt people when it comes to being more joyful? I guess that, that is more of a George Valiant question, but... Uh, <laughs> The brain is not a chemoreceptor. The brain is enormously sensitive to other people's eyes, other people's touch, and the modulation of other people's voice. <laughs> Anyone? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Possibly in, um, in, in keeping with that, I, no, I, I, I do think that, uh, uh, that uh, drugs like Prozac uh, might, and serotonergic drugs uh, uh, can help depression, which may be different from uh, achieving happiness or contentment, but it, uh, it's a necessary condition for, uh, for happiness or contentment, not being depressed. Um, uh, how well they work, as many of you know, is a big argument at the moment, uh, whether uh, in fact uh, psychiatry have, has overestimated their effectiveness as drugs, and that's still uh, you know, uh, an ongoing and important story. Uh, uh, I'm a clinician, I use them. I've seen people who I think they help. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I also understand what George is talking about and uh, when Peter Kramer wrote his uh, old book as Prozac was appearing, uh, listening to Prozac, he described me as a psychopharmacologic Calvinist, I think, for my lack of enthusiasm. I don't think that's quite accurate, but, uh, but maybe I'm uh, a little in George's camp, too. I can perhaps add something related to the brain 
boring as it may be, I guess, for some, but uh, I mean, the SSRIs, have, it's an, uh, as Richard said, is an active area of research in trying to understand what do these medications do to the brain, and there are a number of, of studies that have shown that uh, drugs like Prozac, uh, SSRIs in general, have, uh, they, they enhance uh, the formation of new brain cells in, in the brain area called the hippocampus. There's also, uh, there's some studies, I mean, it's, 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 it's not all clear, it's some controversy, but uh, there's also some studies suggest that enhance uh, some uh, neurotrophic factors, uh, again, suggesting that maybe they are doing something to the brain. We have done studies related to fear control and fear extinction and how SSRIs can enhance fear extinction. In fact, we've shown in, in, uh, in both humans and animals that they can facilitate fear regulation. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Dr. Malad, a uh, number of people here have taken a keen interest in you having been so traumatized by couscous and uh, <laughs> there's actually a couple questions to that um, and did you ever try for example cognitive therapy or or positive conditioning to conquer this uh, <laughs> this monster of couscous in your life mother tried for a number of years and to no success, unfortunately. <laughs> what, I, what about just, you know, so, more broadly speaking, the role of things like cognitive therapy in... Yeah, in no, that, I mean, they, so, so, the, so the, the actual, you know, uh, I, I'm beginning to warm up to it. And, uh, <laughs> But there are different ways of cooking it, and that particular way <laughs> has a particular smell that I just can't tolerate to this day. But but speaking of you know in terms of cognitive, I mean I'm I'm not the clinician. Maybe you guys should talk about this. But uh, we're actually looking at, at at CBT, other types of forms of therapy and exposure therapy, and essentially they're extinction therapies. Basically, the idea you try to push yourself to be exposed to these. Uh, couscous in my example, and then try to restructure, like, okay, I'm not, you know, it's not 30, year, 30 years ago, it probably was a bug, it's irrational fear and things like that, and they do often work, and uh, I just don't want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your honesty. <laughs> Here's an interesting one. The fact that, uh, oh, um, yeah. Yeah, we, we all make choices about what difficulties we actually think are worth trying to overcome in our lives and uh, put the energy into those. And some we choose not to. <laughs> Someone asked, uh, is fear different between men and women? And maybe we could even just expand that question a little bit more if uh, any of you in the different areas that you were talking about, are there interesting observations about gender difference, perhaps? So when I was uh, doing my, uh, my PhD research, a high school uh, group came to our lab and, and asked us, what gender are we studying? And, um, and I said, we study male rats. And he said, why? Hmm. They never thought about that, why? Um, because they're easier for us to study because of the variability in the female. Because the females, there is this cycle, especially in the female rat, the female rat cycles every day, in fact. So it, today it's in one cycle, the next day it's in a different phase of the cycle, and the hormones fluctuate every day, sometimes in the morning and the evening. So we, as a field, we unfortunately have avoided uh, looking at differences between men and women uh, in neuroscience, that is, until very recently, and this is in fact a very active area of research in my lab. So we published a number of studies recently now looking at differences between men and women and how they regulate fear. And not only that, uh, what do hormones do? What does estrogen do? Uh, this is an area of interest that actually my wife is in my lab who's been interested in this for, for a number of years and now we're doing this line of research. And it turns out that the, basically in summary, the higher the estrogen in women, the better their ability to regulate fear. So if you're in, in, in the late follicular phase, for those who know your cycle, and when your hormones go up, just about your ovulation, and then later in the luteal phase when, again, progesterone goes up and then estrogen goes up, those are times in which women do better in controlling fear than other times of the cycle. And uh, the, the, the men seem to be more, most comparable to women actually in those phases. So, and we were puzzled by this. We thought that men, because they're 
low hormonal state, low estrogen, would be would behave as women with low estrogen. Turns out, no, that's not the case. It suggests that testosterone gets converted to estrogen in the male. So in, in summary, estrogen does seem to have a big role in, in, in women in, in, in regulating fear. And we're, it's a very active area of research now that we're starting to look into and pay attention to. Okay. Does anyone else want to come? OK. Um, <clears throat> How does, what do we know about how different forms of media, in particular computer screen time and so forth, affect our emotions? Well, we do know that they're the part of the brain that deals with social judgment gets input from all the senses. And so, it's, if you have a teenager communicating mostly through texts and emails, they are not going to have the same ability to learn uh, social judgment uh, in the same subtle way than they would when they're in the presence of real people. So there is a certain danger in people spending so much time in front of the computer because you don't get the input through all five of your senses in quite the same way. To dramatize this a little further, the one thing a computer doesn't do is form a relationship with you, and that's what makes love and joy so dangerous. And to illustrate this in a concrete way, just think of what your nervous system and your skin response is going to do if you touch the arm of your chair and then contrast it with if you just reach over and touch the person next to you. We're profoundly sensitive to humans. That's how we're hardwired. That's how the brain works. And a computer is, as a substitute for people, is like substituting sawdust for coffee. <laughs> Excellent. Good answer. I think, we, uh, I think we have time really just for one more question since it's already 7.30. And um, this person asked, do people with conditions such as Asperger's or autism spectrum diseases, do they struggle to feel to find joy? And then, then uh, put down the relationship between our understanding uh, the nature of connections versus our ability to experience joy. So that's, but, but yeah, d are people, I guess they're trying to ask, are people who suffer from these conditions, is there a, an awareness of uh, joy and happiness and so forth? And it, it, it depends in part on how severe the illness is, but for a smart uh, child with autism or Asperger's, as they grow up, they discover they have this gaping inability, and it's one of the great tragedies of human life, is they're aware that there is love out there and joy, and they can't uh, access it. The, the inability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes uh, is a terribly lonely feeling. And even if you're not quite sure what it is you can't do, you know, many people with Asperger's who are not able to put themselves in somebody else's shoes might try to make a bridge or to reach out, and it often falls flat or, you know, so that is a terribly painful feeling, just as George says. Okay. Well, I guess that concludes this event. Uh, I just want to again a special thanks to our presenters.
And we hope to see many and all of you for our next two programs. Thanks.